when I hear the word quality, because often, you know, I guess quality when it comes to protein, at least within the literature, is defined by the amino acid kind of ratio and value, which I totally get. But then I think a broader definition of quality for me is how is that that protein source, whatever the food matrix is that you're consuming to get that protein, how is that affecting your risk of the diseases you're most likely to get? Absolutely. And I think you're right. And because the word quality, I think, insinuates um, uh, optimizing for overall health, where actually, like I mentioned, the dia score was invented purely to uh, assess the risk of malnutrition in global populations. So it's not for you and I, and it's not for this ability to improve our uh, anabolic, uh, the, or it's not a reflective score for anabolic potential of these different ingredients. It's, it's more encompassing of, you know, the purpose that it was actually started for. So I agree. I think, uh, maybe you should start another scoring system that actually is reflective of cardiometabolic disease, uh, bone mineral density, all these other factors that I think would be more, uh, more relevant for the word quality. Let's say someone's you know, at that 110 grams of protein per day and they're hearing everything you're saying and thinking, okay, this is great. I'm going to eat some more plant protein. Again, though, they're worried that that, that protein is going to come packaged with more calories. Perhaps that's their, their experience. What types of things would you want them to be thinking about there? I think um, this is actually something we we teach in our coloring medicine course. Um, so side sidebar, we um, we started a coloring medicine program at a number of different medical schools. We actually borrowed the idea from America. It was started in Tulane and um, Columbia, and I think Harvard Medical School as well. So uh, a bunch of us back in 2018, it was dietitians and some other doctors and um, chefs. We decide to create a curriculum and then we teach um, medical students. So in the prime of their medical education career, how to start having conversations about nutrition in a clinical context and also how to cook. So we actually get them into a cooking environment, cooking with uh, other culinary students. It's really, really cool. And part of the discussion is uh, having a conversation with a patient who is resistant to this idea of uh, consuming less meat. And one of the ways in which you do this is creating combination recipes. So you have lean meat, uh, like lean mints in a spag bowl, but you add lentils to it and other nuts and seeds. Um, this way you're consuming less from the meat, which is actually calorie dense and you're consuming a lot more fiber, um, and reducing your calories whilst actually maintaining that protein amount. And you're probably over consuming protein in this sort of like typical spag bowl meal anyway. So I think this as a, like a, a little strategy is a way to ensure that you're not over consuming energy in the form of calories whilst you're also consuming enough protein, which is why I think a, a pragmatic strategy for anyone looking at make, weight maintenance would be to consume more from plant-based proteins because they tend to be lower in calories. If someone is consuming animal uh, sources of protein, how do you, I guess, delineate between the sources of animal protein that you would say are healthier than others? You know, when people are going to the grocery stores, you know, how are they navigating that space when it comes to you know, deli meats, or processed meats, different cuts of red meat, fish, chicken, eggs, all that sort of... Yeah. So the processed meats, I would say, you really want to use as luxury items rather than staples in your weekly shop. So these are the prosciutto ham... <laughs> I, I know I'm saying this on a plant-based podcast, but I know my wife loves these kind of things. She's Italian, so prosciutto and parma and all these different products, saucisson. These are luxury items. You don't want to have this in your weekly shop. The lean meat counter is where I would uh, focus most of my attention. So lean chicken breast, lean uh, uh, thigh. Um, having red meat is okay in my in my view, as long as you're combining that with good amounts of other plant-based products and particularly high amounts of fiber. So lean mints, uh, lean red meat, um, 
And uh, oily fish, I would say, is sort of like a no-brainer. Um, whilst that might be calorie dense, you're getting a lot of those quality oils that we know have got omega-3 or long-chain omega-3 fatty acids uh, that are potentially anti-inflammatory, and they do have a good amount of protein in as well. But within the fish counter, I would always opt for the the smaller oily fish, so anchovies, mackerel, herring, sardines. Those are the things that we typically get in our shop so list as well. Less heavy metals. Less heavy metals as well, so they're less accumulating because um, the the bigger ones like swordfish and tuna tend to be pretty heavy. And actually, the last time I looked at a study looking at heavy metal accumulation in fish was probably uh, dated over four years ago. So I'm unaware at this point in time as to what the latest amount, uh, oh, the latest data is saying about the pollution in our fish, and that is worrying for me. Um, so that's something that I'm cognizant of, particularly as we have a small boy, particularly as my wife was pregnant last year as well. These are, these are things that we were we were thinking about. So we did actually reduce our consumption of fish purely out of pragmatism and a precautionary approach rather than it being evidence-based. And we actually had a lot more plant-based proteins, which is why I want most people to spend their time. And in the book, I've got this double page spread of different total protein amounts because I want people to become really good guesstimators of protein rather than having to measure out absolutely everything, which I think can spiral into a, an unhealthy relationship with eating in general, which is why I'm not a big fan of calorie counting um, long term. I think it's a good exercise to be calorie aware, but I don't think it's something that we should be doing every single day unless you're like a bodybuilder or you're into body composition. So the, the ones that I always lean towards are soy uh products edamame tempeh but also things like hemp seeds uh almonds peanuts tahini uh greek yogurt i know that's plant uh, not plant-based but there are some really good quality greek yogurts out there that are like high in protein pretty low in in fat and calories yeah yeah exactly and uh, the nuts and seeds is a bit of a difficult one because they are generally higher in calories but i think they're worth it Personally, I think shelled hemp seeds are one of my favorites as well. Um, and whilst they do contain those oils that do push up the calorie count, I just think they, they come bundled with a lot of fiber. So you're getting a lot of benefits there. And this is where the calorie conversation becomes uncomfortable because I think when people obsess about energy balance, it push, pushes these kind of quality products out of their diet. I don't know if you agree. Yeah, well, and I think nuts are particularly interesting because when they're consumed in a whole food yeah. kind of unground form, it seems as though maybe not even all of the energy calories are actually yeah. is actually absorbed. Yeah. And from a at least an epidemiology point of view, which is an association, um, they tend to associate with healthy body weight people that are eating whole nuts. And that might be the nuts themselves. It could be what they're not eating. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, which is always important, the comparison. But then there, there are clinical trials showing improvements in cardiometabolic risk factors with nut consumption. So I like to think of nuts as something that you like top meals with yeah. or top in your smoothie yeah. as opposed to sitting down on the couch and eating a whole bag of, yeah. particularly if particularly if they're salted yeah right yeah i know we've all done that right? yeah yeah I know, i'm just thinking back to this week or how many times i've actually done that i spoke to sarah berry on the podcast a couple of uh, months back and she told me about a study where they looked at um the consumption of nuts and the calories that they absorbed from the nuts and there was a real distribution and the amount of calories that are absorbed from the same like handful of nuts so depending on the individual there appears to be differences and you know I, i'm not too sure how many times this study has been replicated but there's there's a few things to be aware of uh, individual variability what you're consuming said ingredient with so the nuts what are you consuming it just on its own or are you consuming it as part of a mixed meal and i think also the the actual matrix so are you consuming this nut in a smooth peanut form which i absolutely love um or ground or are you consuming it whole with the shell still slightly intact and i think these are all these differences that are going to determine whether you're going to be consuming more calories or less calories but in the grand scheme of things each of those are better options than a lot of foods people are eating 
providing calories, you know, packaged ultra processed foods are providing well, like 60%, maybe more calories. Yeah. Yeah. It's huge. I think in a child's diet in the UK, it's something around that as well, 65, 70%. And when you look at the density of ultra processed foods in supermarkets, it's something like 70 to 80%. And even, you know, I've been in LA now for about three weeks, right? Uh, I've been to some of these bougie supermarkets Man, it's been so, to Air One. Uh, yeah, I've been to Air One. I don't know whether I was allowed to say that or not. But I've been to Air One. It was like literally destination I mean, when, number as soon one. As you said my... bougie, everyone knew. <laughs> everyone knew. <laughs> I, it was like the destination number one for my wife. She couldn't uh. wait to go to uh, Air One and order one of these ridiculously priced smoothies, like the Haley um, Bieber smoothie or whatever it is. Yeah, it's <laughs> like thirty dollars Australian. Yeah, I know that's crazy, isn't it? So we went there, and I was just looking around at the the store, and I was just looking at the other side of the packets, and it's just additives and emulsifiers like this is just overpriced ultra processed food with a high protein you know low calorie label and it's uh, yeah it's a very weird scenario that we're in here because the best place to go is the farmer's market and california's got some great farmer's markets yeah yeah they get the health halo effect yeah pretty, pretty quickly and then you can be tricked into thinking just because it says high protein that it's healthy when it comes to gut health i couldn't find a supplement that did it all. So I formulated one with gastroenterologist, Dr. Will Bolsowitz. It's called Daily Microbiome Nutrition or DMN by 38 Terra. And to our knowledge, it is the most complete prebiotic formula on the market today. We built DMN to support a healthy, diverse microbiome, which we now know plays a critical role in everything from digestion to immunity, metabolism, and even brain health. What sets DMN apart is that it contains clinically proven doses of ingredients like actazin and solanol, and it's a very concentrated source of polyphenols, all conveniently combined to nourish your gut bacteria and promote true microbial diversity. No artificial sweeteners, no gums or fillers, just science-backed, plant-based ingredients in a once a day, incredibly delicious drink. So if you're looking to fuel your microbes and enjoy all the benefits that come with that, head to 38terra.com and use the code SIMON for 10% off. That's 38tera.com and use the code SIMON to feed those gut bugs.